Welcome to Voices from the Bench, a dental laboratory podcast. Send us an email at info at voicesfromthebench.com or look for us on Facebook at Voices from the Bench. Greetings and welcome to Voices from the Bench, episode number 21. My name is Elvis Dahl from Summer Dental Laboratories in Zionsville, Indiana. And I'm Barbara Wojan from Night Dental Group, Oldsmar, Florida. We are of drinking age now. We made it to 21. Absolutely. Hey, we got the big race for the future next weekend. Are you ready? I've never been more ready for anything in my life other than my CDT exam. So yeah. yes, I'm ready. Excellent. You're going to win this whole thing, right? I have my own personal goals and I'm not at all competitive. So I'd have to tell you that I I want to come in the top 10. So we'll see. No kidding. Wow. That's pretty big. Yeah. I bet you you'll come in first place for all the females named Barb. How's that? Uh, that (laughs) (laughs) That'll probably happen, actually. Nice. Let's take a moment to congratulate Barb. Uh Uh-oh. In the latest issue of IDT Magazine, she was picked as one of the most influential women in dental technology. So congratulations. Thank you. Along with some other past guests that have been on this podcast, our very, very first guest ever, Renata Bundy. Yay. And uh, also, yeah, Denise Burris. So awesome. Yeah. I think it was a great article. Well-deserved, ladies. Hopefully we can get some of the other ones on this podcast sometime. I think that would make some great conversation. I actually saw Elizabeth Curran mention that we should all get together and, and have a chat. Yeah. Podcast or an interview. So um, I'm, I'm willing and able. Today's interview is all about a really fascinating aspect of our industry that I really don't think gets discussed enough. And that's the art of a denturist. It's one of those things yes. that yeah, it's awesome. one of those things that most of us have heard about but don't know a lot about, especially for those in the 24 states that it's not legal or regulated. I don't know about you Barb, but here at Summer, we have technicians helping doctors chairside all the time. And a majority of the time, it's for removable cases, be it either an impression, a try-in, or help picking up an attachment. You know, we actually know what we're doing. So I think there's a good argument of labs getting into the denturist field, you know, if you're in a state where it's legal. Yeah, for those of you that do removables, uh, you know, I don't, but I found these guys to be amazing and interesting, and I learned a lot. So I think it's a great episode, and I hope you guys enjoy it. It's a fascinating conversation. We got two great denturists talking about their field. Let's do it. Voices from the Bench the interview. We have two gentlemen joining us today from the world of denturist. In Indiana, where I'm at, it's not a thing. So I really don't know much about it. And through a connection from another gentleman we did a roundtable with, he put me in touch with Patrick Allen, which is a licensed denturist in Maine at Central Maine Dentures. I believe I have that correct. That's right. And then he put me in touch with the whole association of dentists, and I had no idea there was an association. And then we brought in Todd Young, licensed denturist, out of Oregon at Natural Dentures. Good morning, gentlemen. How are you? Good morning. Doing well. Excellent. Excellent. So what I'd like to do is kind of hear about how you guys got into the business and what made you decide to lean towards being a denturist. So let's start off. Patrick, how did you... uh, How did you end up where you are? You know, it's kind of a funny story. And I tell people all the time that, you know, seldom does a young person wake up uh, and decide that they want to make dentures. Um, You know, it's sort of something that you have to be shown into it. Either it's family or uh, friends and almost everybody that I've worked with. You have to know somebody, I guess, to sort of find uh, this career. So my path is kind of unique in that my stepdad, uh, he was a uh, denturist from Canada. He was one of the first denturists in Maine. He came over and uh, and started a clinic and grew to seven clinics. And my mom had worked for an oral surgeon and um, was looking to kind of change careers. She um, sort of wanted to get out of being an oral surgery assistant and uh, got, a, got a job working with him in the uh, denture office. And they they got to know each other and, and uh, eventually got married. And then um, I uh, got caught complaining about my job. 
And uh, <laughs> he asked me if I'd ever thought about going back to school. And I sort of naively said, well, sure. And uh, uh, next thing uh, I know, I'm moonlighting in the lab and learning the plethora of information that, uh, that you need to know and uh, going to school. I went to uh, George Brown College. Uh, they offered a uh, what was called the IDEC program, a kind of an abbreviated course for experienced technician. And I was able to work and uh, go to school at the same time. And uh, in 2008, I, uh, I graduated and switched over into being a um, you know, healthcare professional. I'm coming up on 10 years next month. And uh, about a year ago, I kind of went out on my own. I've got two small clinics that I have in Waterville and in Bangor, Maine. And uh, it's just my wife and I, we're more of a mom and pop uh, operation, if you will. Um, but I do, every aspect of it is far as uh, seeing the patients for the initial consultation, going through, taking impressions, bite registrations, uh, try-ins. And um, the only thing that I do not do in my lab um, as part of the process is I don't do any casting or, uh, you know, for metal frameworks or uh, process uh, flexible partials. So I leave that to Jeremiah Nass in Inverness, Florida, and, um, and to Brian Johnson at Sterling Dental Arts. So that's my abbreviated version. Does your stepdad still own his seven offices? He does not. Unfortunately, he passed away of an unexpected uh, heart attack uh, a couple of years ago. It, it was uh, it was a, a pretty big operation. He had actually started a uh, dentist college, and um, he had a lot of irons in the fire. And um, his his daughter, um, you know, ran things um, um, for a while. But as most of us know, if you're not ready to, you know, maybe take on the rigors, and especially having seven offices, um, it, you know, it's a it's a it's a big project to sure. to, to undergo. So. So unfortunately, he's no longer with us. Um, my uh, my sister Stephanie, she uh, she has actually kind of stepped back from practicing uh, indenturism. She her passion really is working in the lab. Uh, so she's she's really gone back. She actually works for a couple of different offices. She works for a denturist clinic. It was actually her old clinic that she um, that she sold, and then uh, she works uh, for another lab a couple days a week. Um, but that's really um, you know what she enjoys. So excellent. Well, I appreciate that. So tell us, Todd, how about yourself? How did you become a denturist? Well, there are some similarities to Patrick and I's story. I was a, a, a graduate in management and finance from the University of Oregon, was working in the restaurant field, and uh, happened to marry a beautiful young woman whose father was one of the original denturists here in Oregon. Really? Interesting. And uh, so after about a year, I started looking uh, to make a change, a career change from the, uh, the, the restaurant business, started looking at buying some other businesses. And my father-in-law, Ken Holden, ended up uh, asking me if I wanted to come check out his business. He was getting ready to retire. And, and uh, so I came down and uh, spent a couple of days with, with uh, Ken. The first day, I ended up spending in the lab and worked with his lab technicians. Um, got to play with wax and Bunsen burners and plaster and see the art side of making full prosthetics and partial prosthetics, which I really enjoyed. Um, the second day, though, is when Ken took me chair side, and I got to shadow him for the entire day. And about about mid afternoon, Ken uh, uh, Ken walked into a room and was delivering a uh, young woman about the age of thirty three or thirty five her final final uh, prosthetic, and it was just an upper denture, mm -hmm. uh, but she had had a poorly made immediate denture that she'd been wearing for about eight or nine years. Wow. And uh, so, so Ken ended up placing this uh, denture in uh, her mouth and, and uh, handed her the mirror. And she looked at it and just started crying and uh, uh, jumped up, gave Ken a hug. And, and you could just see this person's life, the trajectory of her life change right there in the chair. And I mean, at that point, it was... It, well, I won't say it was completely sold, but it was sure. it was pretty much man. If I if I can do something artistic, and if I can have an impact on people's lives like like that right there, that that this is something I'm really interested in. And then later that evening, Ken and I went over the uh, the books, uh, the the P and Ls and the balance sheet, and I said, yeah, this is something I can definitely get into. And so like Patrick, I ended up in the George Brown program. I think I graduated in 2001. And grew the practices. We now have four practices, and I think uh, roughly thirty employees, a couple dentists, and hygienists working for us. 
Wow. And they're really enjoying it. About five, six years ago, my brother and I founded the American Denturist College hmm. um, to help the profession grow. And uh, that's what I've been working on almost exclusively for the last five, six years is uh, growing a program. Uh, we actually just recently received federal accreditation Wow! Excellent. as an independent Denturist program. And so we're, we're super excited with the help of a lot of people from the National Denturist Association, the State Denturist Associations, a lot of folks like Patrick uh, that, that, uh, that are getting involved at the grassroots level to see this profession grow. So I guess that's my story in a nutshell. Yeah, it sounds like you and that school might be a whole other podcast within itself. <laughs> that sounds like it's pretty interesting stuff going on there. It's definitely uh, been a challenge, but super rewarding. It is a fully distance education. So it's, uh, it's all online. We utilize some, some uh, externship with experienced mentors for the clinical side of things. And, and so it's a very unique business model, but we've had a lot of, well, we've, we've got 30, 37 graduates uh, through the program now, and, and uh, a lot of them are out practicing in the real world. In fact, one of them is now the president of the, the Washington Denturist Association. Wow, excellent. So we've got a lot of sharp, sharp people coming through. So I know that denturists are not legal in every state. So what states allow a denturist to be licensed? So the states that are currently licensed or regulated is what, what how we refer to it. Sorry. Are, are Oregon, Maine, Washington, Idaho, Montana, and Arizona. So only six? Did I count that Only six right now. Wow. Yes. What's the history of denturists? Because probably a lot of people don't know about them since it's only legal in six states. Where does the denturist idea come from? I, I would say, um, you know, and this this is me kind of talking off the cuff and taking uh, second, third hand information. But I would say the the biggest market for denturists and probably one of the best models across the the globe uh, is in Canada. And uh, most of the provinces have been practicing denturism for you know well over you know forty, fifty years, and. Um, uh, and Todd can probably speak more to. He's done a lot of uh, looking into, you know, kind of how how you go about um, getting licensure and education, and and they sort of go hand in hand. But um, in Canada, I think the the last province to offer denturism was in like the late '60s, early '70s, and. My stepdad, Bill, uh, his father was one of the first denturists in New Brunswick uh, in that time, time frame, and uh, he was pretty instrumental in, in getting it going. But Australia has a really good model. But realistically, Todd and I were talking about a book, um, uh, Denturist, The Birth of a Profession, and um, there's stories of uh, dental technicians seeing, you know, knowing what it takes to, you know, to make a, a good prosthetic and maybe looking at, you know, hey, there's there's better ways to do this. and, and uh, uh, as a technician, you're you're limited to what you can control in the process, and um, you know some of these technicians stepping out there and and wanting to you know provide a, a better service or going direct to the public. And I think uh, a lot of times uh, in a lot of places it started out as a oh um, uh, I think the term that a lot of people use is, is bushwhacking. You know, you're you're stepping outside of what your 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 scope is or what's legal, and then I think later on uh, you know the, there's enough. Uh, enough technicians that are doing it and participating in the, you know, further in the process, and uh, then there's a a movement that grows and and uh, eventually becomes uh, becomes legal. Uh, and I think some of the comparisons we draw are like what uh, nurse practitioners and chiropractors maybe go through. Um, there's a time when they they weren't necessarily taken seriously, but uh, now they're uh, they're an everyday part of our uh, of our medical world. So. Hopefully that, that kind of answers uh, the question. Is everybody okay? I hope everyone's <laughs> all right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry. So I have a question. When you talk about denturism, hopefully I'm saying that correctly, can you give me like the definition of what that means? Do you guys need to have a doctor or are you playing that role, if you will? 
We're independent unto ourselves. Um, the you know our scope, and it, and it does vary from state to state, country to country. Um, you know, every state, country, or province has uh, some of their own restrictions, or you know what what, what their scope of practice allows for. But uh, as a general rule, uh, aside from I, I think Arizona is the only state that uh, you have to work underneath dental supervision. But um, we're we're able to work autonomously and independently unto ourselves. So. We're uh, starting at the consultation. You're sort of uh, determining the the path of path of treatment and seeing that through as far as removable prosthetics go. Um, we don't deal with anything that um, is going to be a fixed restoration. We you know we can deal with uh, dentures over implants, uh, things like that. Uh, when it comes to partial dentures, it's pretty wise to to be friendly and in good communication with the patient's dentist so that um, they can help with cutting rest preps and, and guide planes and things of that nature. Uh, uh, we don't always work directly with the dentist. Um, in, my, in my office, uh, we're about a half mile down the street from an oral surgeon, and we've got a handful of dentists in the area that we work with, uh, make sure that our patients uh, maintaining and upkeeping their dental care, but we don't, we don't offer it directly in our office. Whereas, Todd, you have dentists and hygienists that work right out of your office, right? Yeah, that's correct. I wanted to follow up just a, just a little bit about the history of, of denturism for you, Barbara. It, it actually, it goes clear back into the 1800s is actually when it first started with with an act of parliament, I think it was actually in Belgium, but really, you know, the the very first act was, was in Tasmania in the fifties, but it really didn't start to build steam as this independent practice until the sixties. And in in fact, in North America, that's when Alberta, there was a, there was a health amendment act in Alberta that that was first signed that kind of kicked off Hmm. Canada. So Canada continues to be kind of the, the world leader, if you will, as, as far as a model is concerned, as to how denturist practice, although there's still some disparity in, in scope of practice, we always strive for independent practice. That's the cornerstone of the denturist uh, movement, whether it's called a clinical dent- a dental technician, a dental prosthetist, if you're in Australia. Mm-hmm. Uh, I can't pronounce the German one. I think it's Zahn or something like that. <laughs> denturist here in, in the United States or, or in North America. But as Patrick was saying, reference to to Canada and scope of practice, uh, that, that's who we've looked to in the past. However, the National Denturist Association here in the United States has really come on over the last few years and, and is demonstrating some really strong leadership in mm-hmm. making sure that scope of practice is unified going forward. Although we only have six current states that are regulated, as we say, there's a huge movement that's happening right now. There's a lot of people already in school and already have educations in unregulated states that are starting to coalesce into those state associations. And that's, as Patrick was saying, what we need to look to is is once there gets to be almost a critical mass of people, that's what you need uh, in in a state to go through and regulate it. And then as as far as the scope of practice is concerned, most of the denturist statute and administrative rule in the United States allows denturist to to have any business relationship with a dentist they, they would like. Whether they want to work for a dentist, they want to partner with a dentist, or they want to employ a dentist, uh, it's in administrative rule or statute to be able to do that. Some of us have 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 taken that business model and run with it, and and uh, and others have have uh, like like Patrick has said that he and his wife run run a couple of offices, just the two of them. There's several business models that are effective and and serve really an, an underserved people group right now in the United States. Absolutely. I appreciate the full definition of it. I've got to have a greater understanding of it now. Do you know there's only six states that are legal now? Are there any of them that are looking to make it legal? Uh, yes, there are. And I would have to refer to, to uh, the legislative committee at the at the NDA. We're very careful about talking about what states are potentially uh, looking to regulate. Understood. Uh, the reason being is, as you may know, uh, there, there's there's a little bit of pushback from a portion of organized dentistry from the from the American Dental Association. They they like to protect their scope of practice. They don't particularly care for independent mid level uh, dental professionals. That makes sense. I don't agree with it, but yeah. I see it. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll tell you, there are three or four that are coming close to, to going through the regulatory process. Yeah. More than likely, going to ballot measures mm. or initiatives. 
That's wonderful. I can see where a lot of young um, dental technicians could have really, really good, successful, you know, livelihoods if they get into this early and they know what states they can look at it and, you know, start up their businesses like you guys did. It's pretty cool. I actually see it for established labs. Mm -hmm to bring on a denturist or have one of their removable technicians go through, become that. I mean, now you've got, you've got another aspect, another profit center Hmm. to those labs that that you can actually either bring people in house, or if you don't want to disrupt your business model, send them out to work chair side with, with your closer dentists that are doing higher level work or that need help with taking centrics and taking verticals or maybe need some help with impression taking on full, you know, edentulous arches. It's definitely a skill. You actually directly market to the public? You know, Barbara, after after almost 40 years in Oregon of legal denturists, and I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of dollars that, that denturists in the state have spent on television advertising and that that still gets lost to the public that you can go directly to a denturist with no referral. You're working directly with the man or woman that is that is going to be building that prosthetic, mm-hmm. designing it, fabricating it, and fitting it. And that has the, the skill hand and, and, uh, and mind to be able to do that. I love it. And to add to that, I'll tell you, kind of tying in different business models and everything. And my wife and I, we've we've kind of gone back and forth. There are times we get so busy that I sort of start considering maybe uh, outsourcing my processing to, you know, one of the local area labs. And she really digs her heels in and says, no, you don't understand. Most of the patients that call, the, the big prerequisite that uh, they're looking for is they want to know that I am going to make their denture start to finish, that they've had a denture made elsewhere that was sent out and they felt like there was they perceive that there's something lost in that process. So uh, like Todd said, when you have someone who oversees the entirety of the process, um, there's, there's nothing that gets lost in, uh, you know, in the, the exchange of hands and the, and the work that goes back and forth. I, I think it's invaluable. You know, it's really, really important. And they have that emotional connection to you. I mean, there's nothing better than changing the lives through a smile. So knowing that they're in good hands, knowing you, I think that'd be a, a huge benefit. Yeah, absolutely. It becomes more than a denture. Um, like Todd was talking about, uh, you know, you're changing lives, uh, you know, giving people back their smile. And, and But they're always amazed at how much control you have over it and how, how far we're willing to go to make sure that it's the, you know, the, the prosthetic that they're, that they're meant to have. So Love it. Thanks. So, Todd, you were mentioning about the pushback you're getting from certain dental groups. How is your relationship with local dentists? Are there ones that strictly oppose that you're in the area? Yeah, that's that's a great question, Elvis. I I think that there is less pushback today, in particular with the younger generation of dentists. There's there's less pushback today simply because removable prosthetics are not being taught in in dental schools, and they haven't been for the past 15 or 20 years. They're they're only barely being touched on. Yeah. Now, there's a few schools here and there that that have, have circled back uh, to starting to talk about it. But I know several that only offer weekend seminars Mm -hmm. on removable prosthetics where uh, anyone that is working with these on a day-to-day basis, it takes years of practice working directly with with the the patient and back in the lab to truly get to a point where you're you're confident and good at what you're doing. So even even though the schooling is great in that with what we're providing to insurers, it, it takes a long time to get good at it. So mm-hmm. circling back to your question, the, the pushback, I think, mostly comes from uh, the, the national and the state associations, uh, dental mm-hmm. associations, just mostly in protecting scope of practice. That's where, where we're getting the pushback. And they really shouldn't be, because as, as you've seen in, in LMT and some of the other publications, the edentulous public is a growing market segment over the next 15 to 20 years that there is no way that we're going to be able to keep up with. We need more specialists in removable prosthetics, which is exactly what a denturist is. Absolutely. I just had residents at the local VA here, and they came to our lab for a tour. And one of them mentioned, and he must have graduated just last semester or something, and he mentioned to me, I can't wait to do removable. I never had a chance to in school. Mm. Wow. (laughs) Wow. So this is, <laughs> I hear what you're saying. You know, and, there, and I, I don't want to discount Elvis. I don't want to discount. There's some, there's dentists out there that are, that are great 
at, at doing removals. And, oh, absolutely. And, you know, probably the absolutely. other segment of dentistry that doesn't appreciate the dentures as much would be prosthodontists uh, as well. Although in my experience, I see a lot of them moving into implantology and they're really honing their skills, at least from my perspective, into oral surgery as well. That's right. So what about the dentists that support you guys? I mean, do they refer patients to you or is it the other way around? Well, yeah, we have a lot of uh, local dentists that they would just as soon never touch a denture. They're, they much prefer to be doing, um, you know, other types of restorative dentistry that, that they enjoy and that are probably better profit centers for them. And, uh, you know, a couple of dentists I've talked with, they said, you know what, there was a time when the, the dentist wasn't known as the good guy. That was where you went because, you know, something hurt and it probably was going to hurt more before they were done. And and he said, look, I, I want to do, um, you know, painless or pain-free dentistry and I want to I want to be the good guy. And uh, he said, dentures, you know, it's hard to be the good guy sometimes. Uh, you know, the expectation between removable and fixed, um, fixed dentistry is, uh, you know, there's a, a gap there. And, um, you know, a lot of dentists that we talk with, especially with immediate dentures, and then that's a, a huge part of, of what we do, that we have a lot of folks that are trying to transition from poor decay and, and massive uh, decline in their oral cavity and uh, trying to get into uh, full mouth restoration. But, you know, a lot of the restorative options are just out of, out of reach financially, so they end up going to dentures. And most of the dentists, they won't touch immediate dentures. Just, you know, there's a lot of work involved and there's, there's a lot of handholding and a lot of emotions that go along with it. And there's days where I, I, don't, I don't blame them a bit, but we get a, a lot of referrals, especially for immediate dentures, um, uh, more and more for partial dentures. A lot of it just comes down to developing that rapport and that relationship. And got, over the past five years, I've had a number of dentists and where my first office started that are saying, hey, I'm just going to send them to you because, you know, you know what you're doing and and uh, uh i don't have to i don't have to worry about this anymore uh you know i know this patient's in good hands once you take on a patient are you doing follow-up or do they go back to their regular dentist it, it depends i mean obviously if uh if they are fully edentulous um there's not many circumstances that they really need to go back to uh, to a dentist at sure. that point, unless there's you know some sort of a suspicious lesion or they're looking into possibly adding implants to their uh, to their treatment. So, but if, if they still have you know we we get a lot of patients that either wear an upper denture and and have natural teeth, uh, we are definitely we want, if they don't have a dental relationship. And in Maine we have independent hygienists, so we have some folks that maybe have a little aversion to dentists. Uh, you know, I'll I'll work them back into a, a good hygiene regimen by getting them in with an independent hygienist. You know, sure. got to start somewhere, and then the independent sure. hygienist has their network of dentists. So if there is necessary restorative work that needs to be done, then they're going to refer and create that next relationship with a, a full service dental office. Uh, I used to work in an office that we worked in tandem with a dentist that uh, he specialized only in extractions, but we had an independent hygienist that uh, had an office space uh, next door to us. So it, it was like three. Uh, uh, three separate offices all under one roof. Yeah. I know, there's a lot of different ways you can go about doing it. Like Todd said earlier, there are still some dentists that uh, there is a, uh, unfortunately, a little bit of a uh, kind of a political component to it, but uh, there's room for everybody at the table. And I think the, the space for dentures is growing quickly. And in a lot of our local dentists, um, they're, they're becoming very aware of that. Yeah. To echo that, uh, our business model, again, is a little bit different, probably 10 or 12 years ago when we brought the dentist in house, I was actually pretty concerned because I had a, a nice referral network of dentists that were referring us all of their, their prosthetic work. And we were referring out implant and extractions. But as soon as we brought the, the dentist in, we saw maybe a drop off for a little bit until they understood that, Hey, they really don't want to do dentures. And then they started referring them again. And, and when they do have teeth, we don't offer hygiene in all of our practices, when they do have remaining dentition, we refer back to those offices so that, that uh, I guess you could say we're buttering each other's mm -hmm. bread sure. on that. You know, it's really, it's, it's, a, it's a mutually beneficial relationship to each of our areas of expertise. I love that. I would think that that would lessen the opposition and, you know, it, scratching each other's back is a perfect way to work together. So I, I, don't, I don't understand that. So I have a question for you guys. Do you guys accept insurance like um, Dennis would? Yes, we do. Okay. So they can go to you with their insurance policies and you have to deal with all of the things that the dentists have to do. So you can 
I want to thank Patrick and Todd. I actually had a chance to talk to most of the board of the National Denturist Association. And I think this group, I think this group has a lot to share and to teach the industry. And I hope we can have other denturists on in the future. If you're interested in learning more, check out nationaldenturist.com. And they actually have their conference coming up in October. It's actually October 10th to the 13th in Las Vegas. Nice. They have some great speakers and some cool stuff planned. So check it out, nationaldenturist.com. Remember, spread the word about our podcast. The more technicians we get to listen, the stronger community we can have. So let everyone know, like us on Facebook, give us a rating wherever you listen to your podcast. And there's still time to get a Voices from the Bench t-shirt to support the Foundation for Dental Laboratory Technology. Head over to VoicesFromTheBench.com and get your t-shirt today. I want to wish good luck to all the racers in the triathlon next weekend. I hope we all raise some good money and everybody stay safe. Enjoy. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you next week. Have a good one. Bye. Bye.